Bonjour, bienvenue à Paris. Welcome to Paris for this uh, first meeting of the International Network on Expectational Coordination. Uh, that's uh, our launching meeting. Okay, the network was created some less than one year ago. And that's the first meeting, so it's a launching meeting. And uh, to some extent, the program reflects the circumstances. Uh, and this program was prepared uh, with the help of a program committee uh, consisting of George Evans, Mordecai Kurz, Jean-Charles Rocher, and myself. So we share responsibility on all the, uh, on, on the content of the program. Uh, as you have seen, we have chosen to have a mix of uh, longer presentation or shorter presentation. Okay. In, the mor in the morning, we will have longer presentation, and these presentations are devoted to, the presenta to uh, a broad overview of, I would say, six main themes for the critical assessment of the rational expectation hypothesis. Okay. Our network is about rational expectation hypothesis, or rather a critical assessment. Uh, we have different views on how good or how bad it is, but we are all convinced that we should come back on the, and not take it as an axiom, but as something that we uh, can uh, prove or disprove and so on. And uh, it turns out that we have chosen six lines. Okay, the first line is presented by Florian on some uh, experiments. Okay, uh, Mordecai will talk after that. And the, the, the subject of the morning conference, which are open, in fact, to a broader public of the Collège de France, uh, are devoted to the presentation of, of uh, these uh, themes, okay, that have been uh, not too arbitrarily cut, but in, that have been, okay, say in some sense, uh, there may be some arbitrariness. And in the afternoon, we will have shorter presentation uh, of the work, on, on the ongoing work in the network on, on the subject, okay, and we have a dense and rich program. Uh, so, so that's for the general uh, view. I should say also that I am pleased uh, that uh, many people were finally able to come in spite of the difficulties of finding good dates or uh, optimal dates for, for all of us. Okay. Uh, we are a large network. There are, uh, b beside Paris, you have 12 nodes, so that's a total 13. You have associate fellows, so we have a network of more than uh, 70 people. Okay, uh, what the network will become uh, is open, okay. uh, but I, I am pleased to see that uh, we have almost uh, more than one third, almost one half of the people will come out at, at some uh, uh, year uh, during, during the, the, the conference. Okay, so. uh, let me finally, I don't want to be too long, I, I, I would like to say that for the network members, okay, which are the node members, and uh, associate fellow who will have a meeting on Thursday afternoon at 5.30, uh, on which we'll discuss uh, the future of the network and the future activity. So it, it's important for you to, to be there and to, to, to think about, what, uh, about the future of the network and to make propositions that will allow us to uh, construct uh, an interesting uh, program. Uh, now, concerning, uh, I hope that all the details uh, are known from you. Uh, the the, the persons who are invited are invited for lunch. Okay, and uh, we will go to lunch around. Uh, no, I suppose every, everything is, uh, is um, uh, settled with your hotels. In any case, you have seen uh, Sylvie Sportouche, who was at the entrance, okay, and she will uh, answer your question. Uh, so I think that we should come to, serious, uh, to the serious part and uh, ask uh, Florian Vagener to talk about uh, exp experiment on expectations. Uh, you have 50, 55 minutes. Okay, so I leave you the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for letting me speak here in the first place because as you probably all are aware of, I'm a stand-in for Carl Homas, who is very sorry that he couldn't attend this kickoff meeting. And so he asked me to 
present some of the results the Sendev group has gotten on expectations and experiments on expectations. But as I'm also the very first speaker in this network, I would like to put the uh, rational uh, expectations hypothesis in a little bit of context. First by remarking that this is of course the ideal place to talk about rationality. I mean, France, French culture is steeped in rationality. It goes back to, the, uh, to Voltaire, to the Enlightenment, to the belief that if all people behaved rationally, the world would be a better place. But Voltaire was building on Descartes, and Descartes was building on the scholastics who went back to the very foundation of the, uh, of the Paris University. Um, a second thing I would like to remark is that I'm not a trained economist. So I'm still looking at these questions with a little bit the eyes of an outsider. I've been, worked at Sen I've been working at Sender for more than a decade now, but some of the bewilderment of the non-economists um, I can still feel, and that bewilderment has also old roots. There's a letter of the mathematician Henri Poincaré to Léon Valra, who regardait les hommes comme infiniment égoïstes et infiniment clairvoyants. La première hypothèse peut être admise dans une première approximation, mais la deuxième nécessiterait peut-être quelques réserves. Um, this has been very nicely translated by uh, Roger. You consider man as infinitely selfish and infinitely clairvoyant. The first assumption may be accepted as a first approximation, but the second one may call for some reservations. Um, Valra hasted to reply, En réalité, les hommes ne sont ni parfaitement égoïstes, ni parfaitement clairvoyants. La théorie doit indiquer avec soin ses frottements. So in reality, agents are neither infinitely selfish nor infinitely cla clairvoyant. Theory should indicate these frictions carefully. But if you look closer, you note that they don't agree on, a, on the fundamental point. Valra considers, well, he says, okay, people are not perfectly, perfectly foresight and perfectly rational, but it, is, it has the role of a friction, like the friction in a mechanical theory. So it's a, it's a, a term, something we, which we have to take into account later, but we can take it at first approximation. Poincaré said, no, 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 no. I don't believe that this is actually a good first approximation. Now, let's um, fast forward to the modern statement of the rational expectations hypothesis by Muth. I should like to suggest that expectations, since they are informed predictions of future events, are essentially the same as the predictions of the relevant economic theory. At the risk of confusing this purely descriptive hypothesis with a pronouncement as to what firms ought to do, we call such expectations rational. Now this is generally considered to be the uh, founding statement of the uh, rational expectations hypothesis. But Muth was very much aware of the limitations and of the, um, the part of the hypothesis which were actually a hypothesis. Now, the reasons, some of the reasons he gave to found it is that information is scarce and economic systems system generally does not waste it. And the second thing is that the way expectations are formed depends specifically on the structure of the relevant system describing the economy. Now this will return later when we shall look at the experiments and we shall see that indeed the underlying economic structure, system structure, it's a, it's, it's a generic term, is indeed as, um, essential for the way expectations are are formed by the agents in the economy. But he also notes it does not assert that the scratch work of entrepreneurs resembles the system of equations in any way, nor does it state that predictions of entrepreneurs are perfect or that their expectations are all the same. So he also states this is an hypothesis, it's a descriptive hypothesis, and it is in some sense an approximation. Muth was very careful 
in writing his paper. This is all from his uh, 1961 Econometrica paper. He also indicated the limitations of the hypothesis. Allowing for cross-sectional differences in expectations is a simple matter. Because the aggregate effect is negligible, as long as the deviation from the rational forecast for an individual firm is not strongly correlated with those of the others. Modifications that are necessary only if the correlation of the errors is large and depends systematically on other explanatory variables. Translated in language of mathematics, uh, we've got a law of large numbers, which is fine as long as there are no big correlations. But in many situations, there actually are these correlations. And those are, we'll, we will see again in the experiments how these correlations can um, throw the validity of, of the rational expectations hypothesis approximation into doubt. Um, it is remarkable that after his publication, the publication of his paper, the rational expectations hypothesis hasn't been used for another well, about 10 years. Only in the 1970s it really took off. And um, I don't have to tell you about it. You probably know all this literature much better than I do. Uh, what was interesting me is the reasons why it took off. What was so great about this rational expectations hypothesis that people wanted to use it? And Sargent, in this 1973 paper, gives two explanations. The first one is, um, what, well, maybe I should first, first remind you of what was there before. There was the bounded rational uh, bounded rationality of Simon, which the, the, that literature modeled agents as being, as having adaptive forecast rules, but they were fixed. So if circumstances changed, or if there was, for instance, a policy measure announced, then these agents didn't change their behavior. So in theory, you could control them. Well, once people started to try that out in practice, it didn't work. And why? Well, whenever you have read about any kind of hyperinflation, you see that agents start to uh, behave strategically. The sergeant notes, the rational expectations hypothesis makes concrete and operational the appealing notion that people use information besides past prices informing their forecast of the price level. In fact, the rational expectations hypothesis models the economy as a big Nash equilibrium where all the agents um, react on the behavior of all the other agents in the economy. But a good theory, usually, this is a, a good theory explains one thing. A great theory explains more than one thing. The second thing is that it expla explains the Martingale properties of time series. In certain instances, it has been possible to test the hypothesis empirically by using the test proposed by Samuelson in the late 1960s. And the hypothesis had fared pretty well when tested on data on stock prices, commodity prices, and interest rates. Um, we all know that stock prices, in particular, uh, in a short run, follow something which looks remarkably like a random walk. It's also noted first here in in Paris by Bachelet. And a rational expectations hypothesis says, well, once the agents account for everything they know, whatever remains um, should just have the effect of a random sh shock. So the resulting time series should be a martingale. Schiller, in 1978, has written um, a kind of review of the then rational expectations literature. And he notes that it is about time scales. The idea that deterministic monetary policy should have no effect on output in the long run is a familiar argument of classical economics. Rational expectations models of this sort make this true of the short run as well. Oops. Friedman. As B. Friedman, has characterized these models which assume that the economy is in a rational expectations equilibrium 
as models which effectively relabel wrong, long run as rational. So the rational expectations hypothesis explains, as, as we now have seen, explains certain time series very well, certain short term properties of time series. But as we also know, because of bubble formation, is that it doesn't do that well on intermediate, um, in the, on, inter, on intermediate time scales. On very lo long time scales, it's again a different matter. But on intermediate time scales, it is very questionable whether the rational expectations hypothesis really does work. So what are the arguments for the rational expectations hypothesis? Uh, so one, the first one I haven't mentioned yet, it is postponious. It is a very restrictive hypothesis, which is good in the sense of Popper, because you can test it. And it has very definite predictions. There are no pre-parameters. Under this hypothesis, agents act strategically. As I said, the economy is a big Nash equilibrium. It explains, for instance, the inefficiency of policy measures, as Lucas noted in his uh, famous critique. And it explains the short-term random walk behavior, for instance, stock prices. But there are also some negative points. Um, I, I hold for it that there's no convincing path selection mechanism. So there's no, I think there's no reason to, um, to assume that agents can select the right long-term dynamics. I know that there are arguments, Davinian selection arguments, which say, well, if you are not selecting the right, um, the right long-run dynamics, then you will get broke in the long run. Um, but the last four years has witnessed a lot of the efforts of governments to um, bail out the people who actually went broke. So I think this um, Darwinian selection doesn't quite work. It also, it's, it's well known, there's a whole list of other um, puzzles, if you, if you wish, for which the rational expectations hypothesis fails to count, for instance, volatility clustering. Um, of course, it needs to be justified. It is all very well to assume that all agents have rational expectations, but how do they get them? And now we've seen that Valera and Muth took it as a descriptive hypothesis of a collection of agents. Since then, many of their caveats have been thrown out, and um, in many accounts of the rational expectations hypothesis, it is assumed that individual agents are actually acting fully rationally. Now, that would assume that these agents have an enormous amount of information about the economic system. And then there's the big question, how do they get that? And how do they process it? And our experiments, as said, will show that they actually have some problems in, uh, in processing that. So in the next part of my talk, I would like to talk a little bit about various justifications of the rational expectations hypothesis. And then I would like to show you some experimental results and compare them to these, to these theories. Um, this is um, a very familiar picture, of course. So to remind us, how do agents learn about the economy? Well, there's this big feedback loop. Here's the market and it moves somehow, it generates data. This part, the, the upper part, uh, which is in, in the sun, as you, as you want, is, is well observable. This is the actions of many, many agents which we can't observe in empirically. We can observe them in a the laboratory. They make an image of what actually is happening there. Now, the rational expectations hypothesis states that the image is equal to what is going on up there. But in practice, it probably isn't. So the question is whether this perceived law of motion can actually approximate this actual law of motion in any sense. 
The agents act, and what, whatever they do feeds back into the market, into the economy upstairs. Um, if you want, this is, of course, the, uh, the basic picture of all scientific endeavor. You do something, and you learn about the system, and then you do something else. Um, Roger, in his 1992 papers, building on, uh, on um, the work of Binmore, has classified justifications of the rational expectations hypothesis into broad classes. There's the inductive class, which says, well, agents are smart, they can think, and they can reason. Inductive explanations rely on the understanding of the logic of the situation by economic agents. They are explicitly or implicitly associated with mental activity of participants, aiming at forecasting the forecast of others. Um, this relates, of course, to the beauty contest problem of Keynes, when you want to predict the outcome of a beauty contest, you don't have to select that. It's usually, usually a woman. That woman which you think is most beautiful, but which you think that others, others think is most beautiful. The same happens in market forecast when you, at a stock market, you don't usually, it's not a good idea to pick the stock which you think is best, but which you think other people think is going to perform best. This will lead to some kind of expectation coordination, because we will see this back in the experiments. But um, the question is whether this will lead to coordination on the rational forecast. In good cases, I like this, in good cases, the rational expectations hypothesis is a consequence of rationality and of common knowledge of the rationality. So in good cases, this, this procedure works. There's a second broad class, which is the evolutionary class, which says, well, agents are maybe not so smart to figure out the whole system all at once, but they can progressively learn about it. Evolutive explanations put the emphasis on the learning possibilities offered by the repetition of the situation. They're associated with the study of convergence of more or less ad hoc learning processes. Um, so the question is how, first of all, do rational expectations equilibria emerge? And the second question is how do they emerge? I'm focusing here on, on equilibria. There are more complicated notions as well. So there, there's a lot of candidates for the micro justifications of this emergence. There's the adaptive stability notion. Um, there's the expectation stability notion of George Evans. There is and several var variations of evolutionary stabilities, uh, competing learning rules, which we at Sendef um, are very fond of. There's also evolutionary stability of competing strategies. That's the Bloom and Easley literature. Um, I shall discuss the first three of these in the test case of the, Muth uh, the Muthian cobweb economy. So this is the system you usually show to, to people when they ask, ask you, or what I usually do when they ask me what I'm working at. So we can look at the theoretical predictions of these different notions, and we have recent experimental results by, uh, which have been obtained by Peter Heymeyer and Thibau in their respective PhD thesis to test these against theoretical predictions. So let's start with the Muthian cobweb. And since I'm going to uh, discuss inductive stability afterwards, I'm presenting the Muthian cobweb in the form given uh, to it by uh, Guinnery. So there's a farmer, or there are a lot of farmers, and all of them have uh, infinitesimal weight. They're distributed over the unit interval. And each farmer I has a certain expectation of the crop price in the next period. And this expectation will actually determine the amount of crop he will grow in this period, the supply SI. Um, we're having a very simple case. We've got linear aggregate supply, just a function S times P. Up 
there. Also, the demand, well, it's not quite linear. It's piecewise linear because it is, it's only linear as long as the demand is positive and otherwise it's zero. We've got the usual uh, market equilibrium. And rational expectation says, well, if you can expect, if your expectation is correct, then this will give you a fixed point equation and the solution to this fixed point equation is the rational expectations equilibrium over there. Um, I believe this is well known to, to all of you. Now, let's start with adaptive stability. These farmers know that if the price is higher than A over D, which is this point over here, um, there will be no demand. So they can confidently assume that the price will be in this interval. And all of, the, all of them can assume that. That's the common knowledge assumption, that the price is in this interval, which I called here V0. But what does that mean? That means that they don't, they shouldn't supply any more than this value, S times A over D. Because if they supply more, um, um, they, they would supply more if the price would be higher, but the price will never be in this interval, so the supply here will never, they will never be able to sell it. So the supply will be constrained to lie in this interval Q0 over here. Oh, but if that is the case, then if the supply doesn't exceed this value, that means that the price must be in this interval, because if uh, this, this, this demand will never be met by, by a supply. So these prices will, will not occur, and the only prices which will occur, which realize uh, the supply are the prices in this interval V1. And now you see that V1 is contained within V0. So starting with a co common knowledge assumption that the price will be in V0, you actually, they, all farmers can deduce that the price will be in the smaller interval V1. Well, and this of course continues. If we are in V1, then the supply must be at least bigger than this value, so the supply has to be in this interval. But if the supply is in this interval, then the price must be in the even smaller interval, V2. And in this way, you get an infinite sequence of intervals, which, if this number, S over D, is smaller than 1 in absolute value, which will converge to a single point, and that point is the rational expectations equilibrium. As you see, in each step, all the farmers have to argue, and they also have to argue that the other farmers argue in the same way. And if they, after the first step of reasoning, they argue that all other farmers know that the price must be in V1, after the second step of reasoning, they argue that they know that the price must be in V2, and so on, until they argue that everyone should know that the price must be the fundamental price. Um, the nice thing about this condition is that this specifies the good case. We are facing a good case when S over D is smaller than 1. So if that condition is satisfied, we call this, this rational expectations equilibrium P star globally inductively stable. So this is one way of... Um, of justifying find the uh, rational expectations e equilibrium. There's a second way, um, which, uh, well, the best way to think about it is to rewrite the whole cobweb mo model and fo forget about the quantities and rewrite it immediately in terms of prices and expectations of prices. So these are all linear functions, so the resulting the resulting relation is linear as well, and I've written it down here, with the parameter alpha as now minus s over d. p star is again the fundamental price. So the expectation of the price 
will determine the actual realization of the price. So there's a mapping. There's a mapping T from the expected price Q to the realized price P star plus alpha Q minus P star. And the rational expectations equilibrium is actually a fixed point of this mapping. Now, when can this fixed point be reached? Well, there's the theorem that the equilibrium P star is globally expected expectationally stable, sorry, this is the definition, globally expectationally stable if it is a globally stable equilibrium of the following differential equation. Um, so it's a differential equation where Q dot is the size of the difference of the um, realized price minus the expected price. And if P star is globally expectationally stable, then we can construct a least squares learning rule which will actually converge to this um, fundamental price. Now, I would like to draw your attention to the condition here, which looks deceptively similar to the condition we had a second ago, but now alpha is only required to be smaller than one, but uh, the requirement that it should be bigger than minus one has gone. So this condition is asymmetric. Apparently, um, if you are alpha is close to one, you are more at the boundary of stability than alpha is close to minus one. This we also see back in the, in the experiments. Then um, the third justification is the evolutionary learning of heterogeneous beliefs. In this setup, the farmers are, can actually choose between many different forecasting rules, um, which we usually, but only for convenience, write in uh, deviations from the, from the fundamental. Um, market equilibrium we will have if the demand is equal to the aggregate supply, which depends on the, the expectations of the individual rules. And what we now need to know is how the farmers distribute themselves over the rules. So this is given by the fractions NHT, which still have to be modeled. In um, our approach to this problem, we model this by the discrete choice probabilities. The fractions are proportional to the term e to the beta uh, where u is the fitness of the various rules. If a, a rule is performing well, u is big. If a rule is performing poorly, u is very small. And beta indicates how much rationality or how much evolutionary pressure there is in the system. So if beta is zero, then all these fractions are proportional to one and every rule is taken uh, with the same probability. Um, if beta is larger, then that rule, which has a slightly larger fitness, will be selected by almost everyone in the market. And then we've got the resulting price dynamics, which we can also um, write in this price dynamics form, which is fundamental price plus alpha, and then it's the average expected price, where the average is weighted by these weight factors n. It's of the same form as in the case of expectational stability. This is a very flexible framework because by choosing these uh, prediction rules, you can accommodate many different situations. But just because of this flexibility, it has very little predictive power all by itself. Only if you state that certain prediction rules are more likely to be chosen than others, then it will have uh, predictive power. The good thing is that you can actually go to the laboratory or maybe even um, to, the, to a field experiment and try to measure which prediction rules are chosen. Um, something else which you can do theoretically is let the number of types go to infinity and then these sums will be changed into an integral. This has been done in a paper, um, in several papers written, written at Sendev. 
And then the only thing you know, need to know is the distribution of the beliefs in a big belief space. You, um, you, you, can, uh, you can specify. Now, we call the equilibrium P star globally evolutionarily stable for the purposes of this talk if it's a stable fixed point of this, um, these price dynamics which you've seen before. We have a couple of results, recent results, about evolutionary learning. If this alpha is smaller than one, so that is the case for both inductive stability, then the, the, fundamental, the, the rational expectations equilibrium will be inductively stable and, and also expectationally stable. If sufficiently many beliefs are available in belief stay, space, and if the initial distributions of belief is strictly positive everywhere, so you can move from one belief continuously to another belief and never have to cross a region where there are no beliefs, then P star is globally evolutionarily stable if beta is sufficiently large, so if there's enough rationality. If there, I, or if there's enough rationality or if the, the incentives are sufficiently strong. In those cases, inductive stability and expectational stability, uh, sorry, inductive stability is equivalent to evolutionary stability and expectational stability is implied by evolutionary stability. But in this paper, we also show that the conditions are sharp. So even in the case where we are inductively stable, if the beta is finite, then the rational expectations equilibrium is not necessarily globally evolutionally stable. We found counterexamples to all the conditions um, in the first result. So this was the first part of my talk. And I would like to go to the experiments we performed at Sennef on this very simple model system. Um, in the experiments, we took these price dynamics we perturbed it with a little noise term in order that the, uh, um, exp that the subjects of the experiments wouldn't, get, wouldn't uh, be able to figure out the actual values we put in the computer. And we looked at two situations. Um, the first situation we call the negative feedback situation, but I'm afraid the, the word negative feedback is not quite in its standard use. That means that the deviation of the fundamental is multiplied by a negative factor which is close to minus one. Uh, close to minus one. It's actually about uh, 0 0.95. And this is, as we've seen before, this is the basic structure of the Muthian cobweb. Um, now, recall that the Muthian cobweb basically has two different types of agents on a market, buyers and sellers. So this is belief, what, I believe this is one of the reasons why we've got here this negative feedback. In the positive feedback treatment, the only thing that changes is the sign. It's now positive, and this is the basic structure of asset pricing markets, where all the agents have the same objective, and just it, the game is just to be better than the others. Um, most of our asset price mo models are actually slightly different than this one because this would be then PT plus one, but we've run experiments also on the, those, and the, the comment was, well, if you want to run a real good experiment, have exactly the same dynamics and only change the sign. So that is why we have here PT instead of PT minus, uh, PT plus one. Um, the agents which on this experiment can earn real money. They, uh, if, if they have a perfect expectation in one round, they get half a euro, and the average earnings about 22 euros over 90 minutes. Our subjects are mostly students, and for the students, this is actually quite, quite good value for, for half an hour sitting and what they consider a little bit as, as playing, but they play, uh, they, they want to, to, to do well, so there's, there is some, some uh, incentive pressure on them. The subjects are told, well, 
something about a market, something that the price changes are proportional to the difference between uh, what they do and what is the uh, what is what is the realization? They are not given the exact equations, so they can't figure out the system directly by by themselves. We have different experiments where they actually have been told the whole structure. We find that the results aren't much different, and we we feel that this is the more realistic experiment to do because in in the practice, agents also don't have full precise information about the system. The agents, when they're sitting in their cubicles, they're sitting in the front of a computer screen, <coughs> they see this. They see two graphs with their own predictions and the realizations of the, of the prices. They don't see the predictions of the other agents. They don't also know with how many other agents they're coupled. They're coupled in groups of six. They see their total earnings, and if they can do quick, quick arithmetic, they can comp compete how rich they are at that point. They see the earnings they did this period. Um, they have, they are, I don't know how much they're given. I believe they're given half a minute or a minute. So they should act not too slowly. They have, have a little bit of, of time uh, thinking about a new prediction. And this is the field where they can enter their new prediction. They can enter, as you see it, to, um, uh, to some precision, and then they also get a numerical feedback of the realized value. So, the first experiment, where there's a negative feedback, um, in the first experiment we have a constant fundamental price. We have a small noise term, standard deviation about 0 0.3, and the fundamental price is 60. And this is what happens. Boom. Rapid convergence to the rational expectations equilibrium. Because that is here. And you see that all the action is only here. I mean, we could, we could have stopped the experiment there, but they never, never depart from it. So this is the most interesting part of the graphs. These are the individual predictions of one group. They start out quite distributed, but the average is too low, which because of the dynamics, means that the realized price is much higher. Then in the second, so that's the realized price in the first period. Then they all try, well, maybe this, this is about the thing we, which, we should, which we should forecast, and all the forecasts are here, which pushes the realized pr price down. And now it becomes interesting because the new realizations are higher up. They're not as in, in average, not as far down anymore. So the new realized price is closer to the fundamental. And this continues for a while. The variation between the, uh, between the predictions is quite big, but that is exactly what pushes the realization towards the fundamental price. And well, after that, everyone has learned the price and doesn't, doesn't depart from it. These here are the, um, are the, is, is, is a blow up of, of this around the, um, sorry, this is the difference between the fundamental price and their, ex and their expectations, and you see that it matches it quite closely. This means that for this market, the rational expectations hypothesis is working remarkably well. We had a second experiment because it was a bit of a trouble that we wasted so much good uh, ex experimentation time and now have put in a time dependent fundamental price. So we had first a fundamental price uh, above he about here, this actually 56, then it jumps down to 41 and then it jumps up again to 60, 62 I believe, yes. Um, in these experiments the subjects have been told that they might expect price jumps or some, some shocks to the system, um, but they don't know when it's going to, to jump and uh, they don't know in, in which direction it's going to jump. And what happens is this. This is the, these are eight different groups indicated with different colors. 
and again. They coordinate on the fundamental price quite quickly. Then it shifts. Then they coordinate on the next one. And here something strange happens. Apparently, one of the subjects in group six started to experiment a little um, because it, it's suddenly oscillating wildly. There's no reason for it. But then it, then it jumps. And afterwards, it jumps to the next fundamental price level. And again, they coordinate quite quickly. And here, the, uh, maybe the same guy starts experimenting again, but nothing, nothing else happens anymore. So even if there are shocks to the system, if the system changes repeatedly, in this market structure, in this negative feedback market structure, there's rapid convergence to the rational, exp uh, rational, to the rational uh, equilibrium price. This is for group eight, the individual ex uh, expectations. And we see, again, that they uh, converge quite quickly to the right values. Here's someone who doesn't believe in the shock for a while, but then he's convinced, and then he jumps to the, to the new fundamental value. And well, as, as you see, the, the, the action is quite rapid. Um, put differently, John Muth picked his example really well. In this, in this context, it works. So, the rational expectation equilibrium is, in this case, both inductively expectationally stable. We gave the a subject minimal information about the precise structure of the economy. So they didn't know about the, the, the functional forms, etc. We see that there's rapid convergence to both the constant and the time-dependent um, rational equilibrium. The results are very uniform over the groups. And for this conference, I did um, a little computation. I looked at the decay rates. And um, you can then say, well, if you, if you decay a certain amount of time, that uh, you could relate that to inductive steps. So how many inductive steps would correspond to this decay? And, I found for the different periods values around 11, which is quite a lot. I mean, for naive expectations, you would expect here a value of 1. But this is already 10 reasons. If, if you um, think that the subjects are reasoning, this would mean that they use 10 reasoning steps. Actually, the result should be even better than this, because here I don't take into account that they still have to learn the dynamics. If I don't know whether there's a, a theory about the transients, learning, so about first learning the dynamics and then uh, reasoning how whatever you've learned um, contributes to, uh, to the convergence. But I think that if there's such a theory, then these numbers should be even higher. So now let's go to the positive feedback experiments. And as you might expect, the story here is completely different. In the positive treatment, agents in the first two periods, after the first two periods, they're perfectly coordinated, much quicker than in the negative feedback treatment. And then they are coordinated on something which um, has proper dynamics. Actually, here, the, the the price dynamics crosses the fundamental value. So they are coordinated on a path which has its own dynamics and which they have to follow, because they have to uh, forecast what this path is going to do and have to out-forecast the, 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 the other um, subjects. So these price dynamics have their own momentum, and they pass several times through the fundamental price. Um, this observation is a typo of one of the subjects. And you see that this typo immediately has an effect on the price dynamics. It kicks it upwards. Um, we're very glad about this typo because it gives us an example of a shock to the system. But all these shocks have persistent uh, effects on the, resulting, on the resulting dynamics. And it's, it's debatable whether these dynamics are going to converge to the um, rational price. 
rational equilibrium price. We also see that the deviations from the, um, of the expectations and the, and the true value are very, very small. So the agents really work hard. But nevertheless, they can, um, well, they, they cannot apparently learn this, this price. I mean, under expectational stability, on adaptive stability, you would expect here that you reach this closer and closer uh, in some, some kind of exponential fashion. So we also did the positive feedback in the um, time-dependent fundamental price regime. So with the same fundamental price as you saw earlier. And the results are more or less the same. So this is over all groups. All the subjects within a group coordinate quite quickly on the price dynamics and the price dynamics. Here's another typo. The price dynamics goes up, then it is going down, but it has momentum, it crosses the price, then it's going up here sh sharply, has momentum again. Here they find out that they're collectively too high, so it goes down again. But it's not, not by any comparison reaching the, uh, the um, fundamental price. Um, and definitely not as quickly as the, as the negative feedback treatment. So these are the price predictions within a single group. You see here the coordination is quite quick, coordination on a certain path, and then they're well coordinated. Here probably again a typo, uh, which then swings the, the curve upward. Here it goes downward again, and this might be some end of period or effects because uh, it's a bit strange that there's suddenly two different uh, expectations. So for the positive feedback experiments, we can conclude we again have a situation where the rational expectations equilibrium is both inductively and expectationally stable. There's again minimal structure about the economy, so the agents sh should have to learn it. We've seen in negative treatment that it can, they can, in, under some circumstances, learn it quite quickly. Here they cannot. The experiments show very slow convergence, if at all, to the um, rational expectations equilibrium. But we also see that the subjects coordinate extraordinarily quickly. They're trying to forecast other agents' forecasts. So there is a lot of eduction taking place, but it's not ending up in the rational expectations equilibrium. The resulting price dynamics have some proper momentum, and which means that they overshoot. And again, the results are uniform over the groups. It's not that one group is doing one thing and another group is doing something else completely. We also could measure the distance to the rational expectations. So we took the median of the distance between the market price and the rational expectations equilibrium. And we see in the negative feedback treatment that it's going to zero quite quickly. And in the positive feedback treatment that it stays away from zero and has no, doesn't, doesn't show any inclinations of con converging to zero. So Muth's statement that the market structure, the structure of the economy is important for what happens to the forecast is borne out beautifully by these experiments. Um, we try to estimate some simple models on this in order to make a full BH framework estimation. So we looked at trend rules, trend followers, um, which just say, well, the new price it is um, some, some kind of extrapolation of the previous price, some linear extrapolation. If this is positive, then you've got tr the trend is extrapolated. If it's negative, then, it, then you um, expect that it's going the other way, which is uh, relevant in the uh, negative feedback treatment. We also estimated an adaptive rule um, and this is what we found for the simple models. In a negative feedback treatment, the trend following rule is doing badly. Contrarian rule is much better, and also the adaptive rule is actually quite good. Whereas in the positive feedback treatment, the trend following rule is spot on. It tracks this very nicely, whereas the contrarian rule is, of course, very bad, and also the adaptive rule is... Uh, 
much farther away from the, from the true prices. It's apparently too slow. So using these simple models, we tried actually um, it, it, it about try to estimate a heuristic switching model, so kind of Brock and Holmes model on these on these time series. Um, in this model, we have to cut down on the wilderness of rationality, so we give only a few number of heuristics, so the, the heuristics you've just seen, the trend followers, the contrarians, and the adaptive, and based on the uh, what has been learned in the previous experiment, there's also this fourth rule, the anchoring and adjustment heuristic, which is added to the mix. So the agents have four rules to choose from, and we look at the performance of the heuristic. We just take an um, exponentially weighted uh, sum of um, distances of the expected prices to the true prices. And the second thing is we took an asynchronous updating rule of fractions. So the rationale be be behind that is that there are many agents and not every agent is updating his or her rule all the time. We're only a fraction of the agents one minus delta, which is looking at the new information, and the old, the rest of the agents are just carrying on with the with the rules, which they used the last period. And this um, actually fits the data quite nicely. So I have to point out something here, something rather important. We have the same model which fits both the positive and the negative feedback treatment. So I've got one model for for two entirely different treatments, and they both fit. Well, of course, um, the belief space has to be rich enough for this to, to, to happen, but you, you can do that. And there's no reason to, to believe that actual agents would have a very limited belief space. They just look at what, what is working in the experience which, which we saw. Here they see, well, the contrarian rule is working very well, so they, um, the agents in the simulation um, are synchronizing on this, this contrarian rule. And whenever there's a jump in the fundamental, uh, the contrarian rule is even doing better than all the others. So it is uh, dominating the market here. In the positive feedback treatment, it is, of course, the trend-following rule which does better. Actually, when, when the price is here going the other, in the other direction, here the trend followers would like the, the dynamics to go up and up and up. So here they're doing, starting to, to do less well than the others and um, um, the contrarian rule and the adaptive expectation rule are starting to take over because they can switch better to a, to a declining path. But then there's a, um, there's a new fundamental and then the trend followers are doing better again before the, the next turnaround takes place. So we've got one model, and we can fit with this one model two entirely different dynamics. So, um, oops, I wanted to tell you something. The question is, of course, um, a theory of rational expectations or any kind of expectations of learning or how, pe how people behave should, in our view, be able to incorporate the data of these experiments. Um, these data aren't published yet, but they will be published on our website, and otherwise you can um, send an email to Klaus Holmes in order to obtain them. We believe that any theory should be able to incorporate in one framework both of these, um, of these cases. So I come to my conclusions. We have the rational expectations hypothesis. We saw that it was introduced as a phenomenological hypothesis, which is very good in explaining strategic behavior of agents and explaining also the short-term random walk behavior of time series. Its validity, this is what the experiments have shown us, depends on the structure of the underlying economic systems. So 
If we have systems with a weak negative expectational feedback, then there's strong experimental support that rational expectations hypothesis is a good working hypothesis. But if there's systems with a weak positive, weak positive expectational feedback, then there's weak to no experimental support. Now there's this asymmetry, and I don't understand it quite yet, but it is, it is perhaps a sim, uh, related to the asymmetry in the expectationally stable con condition, that close to the positive feedback, other things are happening than close to the weak negative case. And then um, the reason why rational expectations were adopted in the first place was that it could explain that agents suddenly start doing something else. Um, we now have alternative frameworks that have the same advantage, but it avoid, avoids the excessive demands of rationality of the rational expectations hypothesis. Thank you very much for your attention.